Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to our talk in the colloquium today. We are glad to have Professor Christy van der Westhuizen with us. She has been invited as a guest professor at Leipzig University under a special ministerial program for this academic year, which is targeting uh, to attract excellent international and uh, national female professors to Saxony. Christy is a public intellectual with more than 30 years track record of engaging with democratic change in South Africa. Uh, she is also an external partner in the research project on political populism in Southern Africa, which I'm conducting with uh, Constanze Bloom at the Research Institute of Social Cohesion. Constanze is excused for today because she's still uh, doing fieldwork in Zimbabwe and South Africa. Let me briefly introduce her uh, academic and professional profile. Christy van der Westhuizen has shifted from full-time uh, political journalism, reaching the level of associate editor to research while affiliated as an associate to universities to becoming a full-time academic. Starting in 1991 with the Freie Wegblatt as a production assistant and arts journalist, she then moved in 1994 to the Bild as chief political correspondent, parliamentary chief, and columnist. Uh, a couple of other media engagement followed, but then she ventured into academia and currently is associate professor, senior researcher, and head of research program at the Center for the Advancement of Non-Racialism and Democracy at Nelson Mandela uh, University. She holds a BA in communication from Rans Afrikaans, which is now uh, UJ, an MPhil in South African politics and political economy from the University of Port Elizabeth, which now is Nelson Mandela, and a doctor in sociology from the University of Cape Town. She covers a broad transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research range um, from identity ideology to democracy, and her major publications include White Power, The Rise and Fall of the National Party, 2007, Sitting Pretty, White Africans, Women in Post-Apartheid South Africa, 2017, and this year, together with uh, Hunter, the Routledge International Handbook of Critical Studies in Whiteness. Um, some work in progress that is going to be published soon, Unmaking Democracy in Law and Practice, Perspectives from Scholars and Activists Around South Africa, and a book on institutional cultures in South African higher education. Today's topic is, in the inaugural talk here, post-apartheid remains, South African nationalisms and their fictions and frictions. Christy West, Susan, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much um, to um, Professor Engel for that uh, introduction, and very good to be uh, this evening uh, with all of you. I also just wanted to thank Professor Middel um, and Dr. Rieddorf and also Rüdiger Lauberbach for, for all of his efforts in making um, this event happen. And very happy to see you here. I've, I've, I've been here since middle October and it's my first time in Leipzig. I've been to Berlin a few times and a few other cities in, in Germany. So uh, it's been very interesting to discover um, the city also from the point of view of, of course, its history uh, and there are quite a few contact points on, in that regard with South Africa, of course. If one thinks of, of the end of the Cold War, the massive um, effects and impacts that, that, that that's had uh, you know, on a city like Leipzig, you know, uh, with the reunification of, of the Germanys. I've been to your, um, to your museum and I've realized it was perhaps more fraught than I'd realized, the, um, the reunification process. Of course, in South Africa, a massive impact of, of the end of the Cold War was the end of apartheid, which is, um, so it's been interesting to have conversations with people about these historical, um, uh, com you know, not similarities, but um, resonances, one could say. Um, so, so it's been fascinating, I've really enjoyed it, and it's, uh, it's very good to be here uh, um, this evening with you to talk about the, um, the fraught uh, formation of South Africa, uh, our contending nationalisms and, uh, and particularly the role of, of um, race and ethnicity in, in, these, um, in these nationalisms. 
and where they've brought us to this, this very moment. So I am going to firstly uh, look at the contending whitenesses in colonial and apartheid South Africa and you know, with a view to disentangling these ethnic and racial strands of redistributional conflict. In the Africana case, we see a balancing act between race and ethnicity that would give rise to a so-called purified form of, of nationalism, uh, which had massive ramifications then in the formation of apartheid in 1948. Audentlikate uh, is a concept that I use to capture a particular ethno-racial disposition, one could say, to legitimize Africana claims to whiteness. Um, we make a turn at the Volksmutter as the embodiment of this claim on whiteness. And um, just have a, a sort of, well, not really an in-depth look, but just pass by apartheid, of course, I think. And I thought, uh, you know, one has to bring in the Leipzig option um, because that's been uh, an important um, uh, factor in the ending of, of apartheid. I don't know if people are familiar with this phrase, but it's a phrase that the South African Communist Party used at the time to refer to rolling mass action. So, um, and it comes, of course, uh, from, uh, from the use of, of mass action uh, here in, in Leipzig itself. So um, I refer to it in, in, uh, in, my, in my one book, but now, of course, it's, uh, it's very interesting to be in the city where, where this actually happened and to see um, so many commemorations of it around. Um, then um, the National Party collapsed into the African National Congress. This is something that people generally try to ignore, but it is quite an interesting and very unexpected development in 2006. The National Party is the party that, that created apartheid. Then spatial ambitions, given that we are here at the Research Center, Global Dynamics with its emphasis on spatialization. Um, I will be looking at uh, African and neo-nationalist enclavism and, um, and then we get to the, to the contemporary moment, uh, specifically uh, also in, in relation to the work that I'm um, hoping to do with, with uh, Dr. Engel, oh, Professor Dr. Engel, on uh, questions of, of populism and, and so on. So, so here we will look at what remains of race in the present moment. Uh, and trying to make sense of corruption in relation to populism and so forth and, and so on. And um, I'm drawing to a large extent um, on my um, three major books and, uh, and then uh, also sort of building on, on my work on, on Afrikaner nationalism, always in relation to African nationalism because you can't make sense of these, of these formations in isolation and making sense for, you know, on, about you know, Afrikaner nationalism and looking at African nationalism you know, over the years. So, but now my focus is more firmly moving to African nationalism, but we'll get that to, to that at the end. When we look at the 20th, 20th century making of South Africa, it is a history of conflict among multiple nationalisms, fueled by a rapacious racial capitalism. Our misfortune is that we had not one but two contending settler classes, and they were delivered by different phases of imperial domination to that part of the world. And in this section, I will be disentangling the ethnic and racial strands of redistributional conflict in the creation of South Africa. So colonialism in South Africa from the 19th century onwards was characterized by competition between the two settler groups and hence between two formations of whiteness. A mix of European that included uh, German, uh, but with Dutch predominant, that came to be known as, as Boer at first and later Afrikaner versus British uh, whiteness. Between the British seizure, seizure of the Cape of Good Hope in 1795 and the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1910, British imperialism as English nationalism writ large was predominant. By the time of the foundation of the Union um, as British do Dominion, it was vying with fledgling Afrikaner and African nationalisms. Here it is important to note that in the British Empire, Englishness held sway as a strongly centered, highly exclusive and exclusivist form of cultural identity, as Stuart Hall describes it. As part of the employment of differences across localities in the British Empire, um, to fit these differences into one system, Englishness worked as an invisibilized 
ethnicity placing all other ethnicities. And it claimed for itself the right to command almost everyone else. The colonized other was positioned in its uh, marginality. British imperialists active in Africa in the 19th century projected themselves as a race-based aristocracy in a discourse where race denotes nation. So when we look at, for example, Cape to Cairo imperialist uh, Cecil John Rhodes, he regarded the British as the finest race in the world. The Victorian scholar Lord Acton described other races as constituting a negative element in the world. These other races, said Lord Acton, are sometimes the barrier, sometimes the instrument, sometimes the material of those races to whom it is given to originate and to advance. And of course, the race that it's given, that it's been given to, to originate and to advance is of course the, the British race in this case. So the British had the duty to rule over childlike natives um, in this imagination, not unlike the obligation a decent Englishman owed to women, children and animals, to quote a Friar on this. So this view conjures the British bourgeois hierarchy with its deployment of race, gender, age and the Christian idea of man lording over nature. And this was projected onto colonised people and, as is argued here, also lesser whites like the Boers. So I'm spending time on this to bring you into the picture of the colonial boundaries that, um, and binaries that South Africa uh, was founded on and into which all South Africans have been inducted since the beginning of the state only 112 years ago. And it also uh, explains to us why race remains with us um, today. So homing in on whiteness, the early colonial racial construct of the noble savage was applied to the Dutch settlers in the 1700s. Uh, European travellers meeting these um, it's a mixture of European but predominantly Dutch uh, settlers in the 1700s in what is today South Africa thought that the distance from European civilization and the distance from the so-called pernicious influence of luxury nurtured virtuousness in these settlers. But then later on these colonial rationalizations shifted to less favorable stereotypes and we see European travelers, uh, travelers depicting what was then known as the track bouche, which just basically means uh, people, pastoralists who move from place to place, of the late 18th century as miserable and lazy and differing from the indigenous koi koi only in respect of physiognomy and color as their mode of land use and living was in fact the same. So by the late 1800s, the Boers had become in the British um, imagination an inferior or degraded class of colonists indolent, slow-witted, simple, and ignorant. And um, British imperialist Lord Kitchener concluded that the Boers were, quote-unquote, uncivilized savages with a thin white veneer. So theoretically, this discursive construction of Boer and later Afrikaner whiteness exemplifies the racialization of what Gabriel calls a subaltern form of whiteness, so subalternity, people will be aware, is a Gramscian concept that's associated with post-colonial studies, but it is here used to denote a non-dominant, marked, particularist or racialized um, identity within whiteness. So the conditions of subaltern whiteness arise from whiteness never being denied or confirmed, conferred once and for all. We experience, of course, our racial identity as, as much more stable than it in fact is. So, um, so whiteness, like all racial identities, are characterized by changing boundaries of exclusions and inclusions. One just has to think of the, the Italians and the Jews and, and, um, and uh, Irish people uh, on arrival uh, in, in, in the United States, for example. So, um, so you have these inclusions and exclusions along patterns of domination and subordination. Subaltern whiteness serves to construct and anchor a more dominant version of whiteness, which in the South African case is English whiteness and later um, English-speaking South African identity. So what we find with English-speaking South African identity is that it draws on this transnational Anglo whiteness, 
to uh, which which has discarded discourses of universalism in denial of its ethnic uh, particularity. So, um, so it's interesting to see positive and negative stereotyping about the Afrikaner also during the apartheid years from the side of white English-speaking South Africans, uh, with this idea of Afrikaners being simple and warm, but also uncultured, superstitious, and lacking in efficiency. And in fact, there was a concern among white English-speaking uh, South Africans who had, by the 1960s, and this is something that people don't um, regularly uh, hear about, by the 1960s, the most white English-speaking South Africans were voting for the National Party. Um, and they, but they were concerned that Afrikaner nationalists as quote-unquote semi-barbarous political parvenus would be endangering white supremacy because of, of their, um, their lack of efficiency. So these apprehensions uh, echo racial anxieties from the 18th century about the lack of apparent European-style evolution among the D Dutch settlers and the risk of um, white degeneration into barbarism. So it's important for us to keep ethnicity in, in sight and not to collapse it into race. So differentiating between whiteness and ethnicity allows us to look at their interactive effects and to look at these redistributional conflicts within and between ethnic collectivities, as Ratanzi writes. So the ethnicized whiteness of the Boers and later Afrikaners therefore shared with dominant whiteness a point of privilege, a position of power, from where it has been possible to define, regulate, judge, as well as accrue material and symbolic awards, according to John Gabriel. So the animosity between these two whitenesses exploded into the South African War, or Anglo-Boer War. You have the uh, establishment of the British Dominion of the Union of South Africa in 1910, uh, and entering into a white pact between the Boers and the British, and this white pact precluded the, even the limited black political rights that existed at the time in the then British um, uh, colonies of the Cape and, and Natal. So, so they, were, they, meant, they were maintained in those um, uh, territories, but not extended to the rest of the country. Then we see that impoverished sections of the Boer population did not enjoy the benefit of this inclusion into whiteness at the elite level and various cultural entrepreneurs were harboring grievances about the war and imposition of Englishness. This discontent fanned Afrikaner nationalism, and at the same time you had a small but growing class of African intellectuals that was sparking African nationalism. So the vehicle of the most successful variant of African nationalism, the African National Congress, was founded in the heart of this newfangled country in Bloemfontein the city of Bloemfontein in 1912. And only two years later, in the very same city, the National Party was founded as the, the primary vehicle for Afrikaner nationalism. We see the, the wielding of ethnicity and class in conjunction to stake a renewed claim in the National Party politics to whiteness, particularly in the form of a purified strand of Afrikaner nationalism manifesting in what was literally called the Purified National Party in 1935. So this purified version was quite precarious because it was seeking a niche in between dominant British whiteness and the latter racialized others to claim the privileges associated with whiteness while asserting ethnic difference. Politically, a balancing act was attempted between affirming white entitlement simultaneously with an ethnic difference even as that ethnic claim risked being associated with black others. Hence the notion of purified nationalism. So it was against fusion with British whiteness, but for the entrenchment of Afrikaner whiteness behind harder boundaries in the pursuit of racial purity. And this we have to remember was the time of, of eugenics. So the strand of Afrikaner nationalism that went on to state power in 1948 is the strand that installed apartheid. So the whiteness of the Afrikaner, as I've described, is all, has been always already marked, as Melissa Stein writes, and um, in, in con con contradistinction to the descendants of British settlers who claim normalcy via this global Anglo whiteness uh, that I've also uh, mentioned and that retain still 
an unexamined, uh, unexamined um, disproportionate influence in the South African symbolic order. But we see Afrikaner whiteness defying this hegemonization um, of English whiteness through um, Afrikaner folkstrots or people's pride, ideas of noble suffering and Calvinist decency. We see in the 1930s how Afrikaner nationalists reclaim the noble savage discourse of the 1700s to reinscribe simplicity, ignorance, and child and nature analogies as signs of Afrikaner innocence, uncorrupted mentality, and closeness to God. We also see in the 1960s how the rural degenerates of the late 1700s are relaunched as hospitable, brave, and fair Christians, salt of the earth. The success of these recuperations have succeeded in installing a dominant trope in South Africa about Afrikaner whiteness that continues into the 21st century. And here I'm going to quote our previous president, Jacob Zuma. So in 2009, he described the Afrikaners in contrast to untrustworthy white English speakers. And he said, when the Afrikaner says, you are my friend or you are my enemy, they mean it. Up to this day, they don't carry two passports, they carry one. They are here to stay. Of all the white groups that are in South Africa, it's only the Afrikaners that are truly South Africans in the true sense of the word. It's the only white tribe in a black continent or outside of Europe which is truly African, the Afrikaner. That's Jacob Zuma about Afrikaners. So to gr grasp this foundational construction um, in Afrikaner identification, I use in my work the Afrikaans word identlikheid as an analytical concept. And identlikheid um, is approached as an intersectional nexus at which this identity is crafted, referencing certain ethnocultural features. It's also associated with a certain bodily uh, comportment. And um, if we were translated, you would have a conglomerate of words such as respectability, presentability, good manners, politeness, to Calvinist uh, humility. Orientlikheid works to legitimize Afrikaner claims on whiteness. And in my work, I also use it in relation to the established term Volksmutter, or Mother of the Nation, uh, which uh, is utilized uh, to mobilize subjects in the pursuit of race purity. We know that in nationalisms, control over women's bodies is essential, as Anne McCl McClintock also reminded us years ago. The nation is constituted by expelling or submerging differences, including gender and sexuality, in a process in which the paradoxical trope of the Volksmutter neutralizes the problem that real, actual women pose for the patriarchal nation, to apply uh, Zilla Eisenstein's uh, insights. So the Volksmutter demands of its subjects to be woman stroke wife as mother. The Afrikaner women's access to whiteness is legitimized and actively pursued by them, upholding and protecting identlikheid through compulsory heterosexuality and compulsory motherhood towards white social and biological reproduction, which requires the abjection of racialized and sexual and gender non-conforming others. So this version of, of womanhood was pivotal to the purified strain of white nationalism that gained uh, power in 1948, um, with apartheid as a more bureaucratized and intensified form of colonialism, more intricately designed and increasingly more violently enforced system of colonial differentiation and subjugation on the basis of race at the intersection with class, gender, and sexuality. Volkskapitalism, or people's capitalism, was used to entrench a racial capitalism which elevated the majority of Afrikaners to middle class status by the mid-1960s. At that time, we see um, a shift in terms of ethnicity and class. Uh, class becomes more pronounced. There's a capitalist convergence between white and English-speaking South Africans and Afrikaners, and we see steps towards reforming apartheid to, um, uh, because apartheid was starting to be perceived as inhibiting capitalist growth as opposed to, to supporting it. We have the fall of the Berlin Wall, the marking, marking the end of the Cold War. We um, have various uh, factors coming together from anti-apartheid protests to sanctions to the military costs um, of, of maintaining the regime, um, the loss of legitimacy among white South Africans, and so forth, 
or precipitating um, the end of apartheid, the National Party unbans its opponents and it embarks on this double strategy of negotiations for a democratic transition with parallel state violence. Um, in South Africa's case, however, uh, as I said, we, the, the Leipzig option was followed, but in our case, it was not a Friedliche revolution. More people died between 1990 to 1994 than at any other period during apartheid, as we had nationalist forces of Afrikaner, Zulu, and African varieties struggling for dominance. The, um, in the end, the Afrikaner elites in control of, of the state decided against the military option, option which uh, some, has, uh, uh, some people have descri described as surrendering without defeat. And um, we can talk about that if, if people are interested in that whole notion. Uh, somebody very influential uh, um, has been, has been uh, driving this argument, Herman Gilumi, who's um, a popular historian in South Africa. Um, and we see basically Afrikaner nationalism meeting its nemesis in constitutionalism. So the ANC finally comes to power in 1994, African nationalism occupies the state, and in 2006 we see this unlikely collapse of the National Party into its old foe, the ANC. So at the level of the subject, democracy radically challenged claims to Afrikaner or Dentlikate. And we see that the shift from official apartheid to democracy catapulted Afrikaner subjects into moral ambiguity. Roger Sather has just written a um, very uh, interesting book about whites and democracy in South Africa, and he describes South Africa as a failed settler state, which makes Afrikaners failed settlers. This has uh, been particularly troubling for what was arguably apartheid's hegemonic identity. So, um, <clears throat> Ordentlichkeit then is also a term that I use to try to describe the struggle to, in a sense, resurrect and rehabilitate um, Afrikaner identity, to rescue it from the moral abyss of, of apartheid, um, and, uh, and to weather the, the, the upsets of, of democratization. And particularly, um, I uh, look at, at the whole question of, of what happens to this identity in particular locales, uh, you know, how does, it, how does it reinvent itself, how does it rehabilitate itself in the post-apartheid um, period? And the question is, of course, whether spatial ambitions remain. If we think about it, apartheid, as the world itself indicates, was especially a spatial project. So the question is whether the subjects of this um, identity of, of apartheid abandoned whiteness as a spatial mode of exclusion. The, <clears throat> so when we look at South Africa's transition to democracy, it's an end of, of isolation, it's a reintroduction into the world and what um, Stuart Hall calls the global postmodern with those paradoxical dynamics. You have late capitalism both universalizing identities and expanding local particularities. Afrikaner nationalism fell into disarray, but we're seeing a, a recasting through institutional and spatial expressions as a nationalism without a state, um, <clears throat> but now focusing on cultural, economic, and social autonomy, um, and at the same time, and I think this is, this is good news, accepting the political framework that it finds itself in. So following Hall's idea of uh, the, a defensive return to the local, we see that Afrikaner nationalist fragments are drawn together to reclaim ethnic privileges using the neo-nationalist strategy of what is called in my book, inward migration. So inward migration is a wielding of ethnicity to withdraw from shared national spaces while whitening own spaces. So this is a withdrawal into smaller locales that are targeted to be made homely. In, in, in the white image. And this phenomenon I call Afrikaner enclave neo-nationalism. So people might be aware of the town Urania in the Northern Cape in, uh, in South Africa that uh, always attracts um, attention as a kind of an oddity. It's interesting how people who visit the country feel that they have to go to Urania. Um, less noticeable, however, are the white Afrikaans enclaves that have been created by stealth in geographically specific suburban sites in urban centers. These areas have a sufficient concentration of infrastructure and capital 
to be secondary nodes of the large cities of, of Cape Town and Swanee. In Cape Town, um, <coughs> we have the northern suburbs, and they find themselves behind the Boerewoorsgordijn. So the Boerewoors is a kind of sausage that's associated with Afrikaners. So it literally means a curtain of sausage behind which you will find uh, Afrikaners. And that's how people, in, our Captonians, capture the geographical language and, and racial divide also in the city. Similarly, in Pretoria, outside of Pretoria, we have a centurion, formerly called Verwoordburgstad, after Verwoord. And this is also referred to as behind the Boerewoorsgordijn to indicate the historical divide between English Johannesburg and Afrikaans Pretoria. These are not um, unlike the lagers that were used by the Afrikaners ancestors. Lagers refer to ox wagons that are drawn in defensive formations uh, during the inland advance of colonial settlement into South Africa in the 19th century. In the 21st century, new forms of migration take place, as I've mentioned, uh, inward migration, and then, of course, you have people immigrating to other former colonies such as Australia, Canada, and so forth. <coughs> so the apartheid principles of the Fawkes Eyre, which is the nation's own or Fawkes' own, or a and Ayasaka own affairs, are reactivated and directed at these smaller territories to create micro-apartheid geographies. The, there's a, uh, an enforcement of so-called natural apartheid um, divisions. We see that the culture is used as a, as a veil to mask this micro-apartheid. And we see methods of ethnic cleansing, cleansing to whiten spaces to create these spaces as an otherless universe. So um, facilitating the entrenchment of these exclusive geographies is their symbolic articulation with virtual white spaces in a plethora of cultural products using the Afrikaans language as a vehicle. So the place where Afrikaners meet nowadays is under the sign of consumption. And detail, the language, remains central to all of this. You make your retreat into your white Afrikaans world through the plethora of Afrikaner uh, cultural products spawned by reinvented neoliberal Afrikaner organizations from the media to cultural industries to trade unions. <clears throat> so we have seen a, a wholesale neoliberalization of Afrikaner identity articulated with and bolstering Afrikaner enclave neo-nationalism. So <clears throat> if we think, I just want to um, return for a moment to the collapse of the National Party into the ANC in 2006 as, as an unimaginable outcome. If you, if you spoke about this as a possibility in 1985 during the second state of emergency when P.W. Boerta was, was running the country, um, you would have, I mean, people would have completely laughed in your face. So um, <clears throat> we have to remember that at the height of its power, the National Party state built an apparatus that forcibly removed millions of people, that terrorized neighboring countries in the name of Western Christian civilization, that kept successive generations of hundreds of thousands of black people frozen in third world conditions while the white section of South Africa escaped from poverty and rose to a majority middle class, enjoying some of the highest living, living standards in the world, and built an economy on the basis of colonial extraction, which it defended with police hit squads and entities such as the Civil Cooperation Bureau that assassinated opponents inside and outside of South Africa, incarcerated children without trial, and killed unknown numbers in detention on the streets. And it was seriously considering the, the option of, of military dictatorship under P.W. Boerta and the hawkish faction of the party, as I write in my book, um, White Power and the Rise and Fall of the National Party. But in the end, newborn constitutional Democrats, one could say, in the party, won the competition of ideas, as they like to call it, within the party's limited internal democracy, and F.W. de Klerk, as leader and president, followed suit, which is good news for all of us uh, in South Africa, of course, and actually, I would say the word, world. So, but this collapse of the National Party into the ANC is not a fact that's reflected on much. If we think now of this is what the, what the National Party was and this is what it stood for. And perhaps this, this is not reflected on because of what it says about converging interests, which can be drawn back to the transition to democracy with its elite character. There has been a meeting of minds, 
uh, on two grounds, one could say. Exploitative economics, as most graphically illustrated with the Marikana massacre of, of 2012, and ethno-racialism. As we know, identity works relationally, uh, as I um, also indicated with that uh, quotation earlier on with uh, Jacob Zuma, that um, refers to uh, the affirmation of a certain version of Afrikanerhood by the ANC. And Jacob Zuma made those comments at a meeting with the right-wing Afrikaner singer Steve Hofmeier in 2007. Zuma and Hofmeier were subjects in a racial dance, one could say, from one traditionalist, traditionalist to another in a paradoxical rhetorical gesture. Afrikaner settler status uh, was evacuated by Zuma to confirm Afrikaner claims to indigeneity and belonging. So here we see the operation also of ethnicisms resonating with one another. And in the process, a certain re-entrenchment of whiteness was achieved via, via, was achieved via the racialized black other. So regarding capitalism, South Africa had the misfortune of attempting democracy right at the moment of global neoliberal triumphalism. Both the National Party and the ANC were swept up into this due to pressure from the Bretton Woods institutions, Washington and London, as I write about in, in, uh, in White Power. The neoliberal turn, which was evident in National Party policies already from the 1970s, was picked up also by the ANC. The ANC in government entrenched neoliberalism in macroeconomic policy in 1996. Since the mid-1990s, South Africa has had the highest Gini coefficient in the world, beating um, Brazil, which impacts mostly black people. So neoliberal policies combined with black economic empowerment and a plethora of other policies aimed at economic redress did deracialize the upper echelons of South African society, with the super wealthy and the middle classes now, including many more black than, than white people. But today in South Africa, about half of the working population is unemployed. Youth unemployment sits at 77%. 57% of the population are at the latest count mired below the breadline in structural poverty, with 25% of children stunted due to malnutrition. The, um, <clears throat> and this, I would, I would um, argue, is because of neoliberal exacerbation of inequality and also because of the impact of uh, corruption, um, which has been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is also in turn associated with massive corruption. So <clears throat> the most well-known of these networks of corruption that are now crisscrossing South Africa is, of course, Zuma's grand-scale corruption of state capture, which has tipped uh, South Africa into an economic crisis. The nine last years of, the Zuma's, of Zuma's presidency, um, as the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, calls those years, led to the loss of between 28 billion and 56 billion euro between 2009 and, and 2018. The country faced a fiscal cliff last year that was only averted by higher than expected mining profits. While advances were made in service provision and housing delivery, the breakdown of state infrastructure in recent years means that post apartheid gains are being lost. Apartheid geographies remain largely untouched. The ANC extended the largest social welfare network in sub-Saharan Africa, but because of our high level of external debt, which is currently at 70% um, to GDP, <clears throat> it's unaffordable for us to do more to, to alleviate um, the misery and, and deprivation that the majority of South Africans are facing. As is the case elsewhere in the world, various pathologies have ensued in the wake of neoliberalism, including state capture and the rise, the rise of racial populisms that I believe are akin to fascism. So the socioeconomic fallout has produced racially differentiated results. White people, even of the white right variety, have become nearly converted constitutionalists. They're using constitutionalism to assert their rights. The most successful of, of these is the Solidarity Movement with more than 330,000 members out of 4.6 million whites, so it's quite a substantial uh, representative group. Ethnicity remains a vital resource for mobilization on ground level in the face of an increasingly failing state, but interconnections are made across race, uh, interestingly, to address these um, local state uh, collapses by fixing water reticulation systems contaminated by sewage um, and so forth. <clears throat>
So the intensification of internal ANC battles for control of the party has made governance fall by the wayside, and the ANC as a party has become much more inward-looking, very con concerned with maintaining its incumbency. And, um, uh, and we see then also a high and growing level of despondency among voters. So if we look at the 2019 election, the voting percentage has dropped to below 50% if we count all eligible voters. If we look at the ANC's um, support specifically, it's ANC voters that are staying away. Um, the party support dropped below 50% in the local government election uh, last year for the first time. There are now more people who do not vote than vote for the ANC. Therefore, while whites have become reluctant Democrats, as uh, Roger Southall calls them, uh, many black people be, who, because of poverty, remain dependent on the state, feel betrayed by democracy, and, and find themselves dependent on clientelism and patronage to access state resources. So uh, Ashil Mbembe writes about how South Africans feel deprived of life possibilities. There's a very interesting book by Jason Hickel uh, about the, um, democracy as a kind of social death for certain people. He looks at Zulu migrant um, people for whom the, um, the overturning of, of sexual and gender hierarchies by democracy is anathema. They fall back on, on, on certain essentialist ideas of uh, gender and, and sexual hierarchies and age hierarchies that are actually a result of colonial imposition, um, but, but that, that people associate with order. Um, this reactionary cultural re response is due to the calamitous consequences of neoliberal deindustrialization since 1994 that have deprived rural homesteads of migrant labor wages and stripped them of their livelihoods. So um, basically we're seeing South African capitalism's logic of excess juxtaposed with its logic of scarcity making wealth and property highly contested in the post-apartheid moment, uh, which we should read against the background of South Africa's history of black dispossession. So we see it every day, politics of expediency rising, as, as Mbembe calls it. People resort to violence rather than to the law to, to try and get some, some justice. Um, the epitome of this was reached last year with the July unrests which are un uh, unprecedented in the democratic era. More than 350 people died, and we had damage done of about 2.8 billion um, euro. There's, um, this politics of expediency translates into what Hannah Dawson, based on research, calls the battle for patronage from below, where she says what you find that in conditions of extreme inequality, where polit politically connected individuals act in their own narrow interest, poor people assert citizenship by strategically demanding access to state resources at lo local level in a de facto form of accountability, which supplants abstract ideas of equality. So um, turning just to the question of, of ethno-racialism as, as uh, part of a South African politicians joining the global playbook of politicians, Dimitri Erasmus writes in her uh, excellent book, Race Otherwise, um, about the persistence of, uh, you, know, of, you know, how to understand the persistence of race thinking in post-apartheid South Africa. And she said, racialized ways of knowing are not limited to those who are racialized as white. Such ways of knowing and seeing will not disappear once the whites have gone and their statues and writings have been removed. So um, we see um, this particularly in the form of, of this um, populism that has arisen uh, through the figure of, of Zuma since uh, 2007 uh, when he became ANC president. And it's, um, it is worth considering African nationalism in contrast to Afrikaner nationalism. Obviously, Afrikaner nationalism was a form of exclusionary nationalism. While African nationalism, due to historical contingencies, had to more and more adjust its purview of subjects and become, become more inclusive. And this we see back to the ANC's Atlantic Charter um, in, in 1945, uh, where rights were due to be shared with Europeans. 
Uh, we see this in the Freedom Charter of, of 1956, uh, where the idea of non-racialism was entrenched. It was already developed by the unity movement b before. And uh, the idea of non-racialism is quite radical because it talks about acknowledging racial injustice, but as part of overturning and moving beyond race. The interesting thing that happens in exile is that the ANC runs, against, uh, runs up against Pan-Africanism and its position of, of racial exclusiveness and due to pressure adopts what it called an African image to project to, to allies across the, the continent that couldn't make sense of, of the ANC's position uh, on race. And um, I'm definitely running out of time. Is it, is that, am I still okay? Um, uh, it's, uh, but what we have, and this is, it's interesting to look at this history during exile because what we have is a situation of um, the other congresses that were part of, of uh, the Freedom Charter, so the congresses for coloreds, Indians, and whites. Um, those allies of the ANC also going into exile, but not having a formal position in the party because the party did not allow um, members um, uh, who were not African, basically. And then we see a situation of, of um, pressure actually from Indian colored and white activists in exile, um, saying, well, you know what, basically um, wanting, to, wanting their status to, to be clarified. And then we see in the Morohoro Conference of 1969, finally how um, colored Indian and white activists are um, admitted as full members of the party. And then by the mid-1970s, um, uh, members of, of these groups can also join the National Executive Committee uh, of the party. But this tension, uh, Lazoni writes, between non-racialism and this pan-Africanist inspired African nationalism was never uh, completely resolved. Now if we link it to what Halisi has written about black nationalist populism, so black nationalist populism, so he talks about contending populisms within African nationalism uh, in, in South Africa. And black nationalist populism functions to reduce class differences to assertions of na national, racial, multiracial, or eth ethnic solidarity. So it reduces class and it emphasizes these other forms of solidarity in contrast to socialist um, populism. So socialist populists would hold that racial and social justice cannot be achieved in a capitalist order. Black nationalist populists in the African nationalist tradition in, in South Africa would frequently oppose socialism and may express aspiration towards an accessible people's capitalism. Black nationalist populism is also skeptical about liberal democracy, um, ostensibly because of the limited impact of democratization in South Africa on black people's livelihoods. Um, I came across a very interesting piece of um, writing by Brian Levy, who's uh, formerly of the University of Cape Town, who has co-written work with Mbeki's former head of economic policy. So Thabo Mbeki, of course, the president that was ousted in 2007 by Zuma, who's sort of most associated with neoliberal, uh, the neoliberal policy uh, in, uh, in the ANC. So Brian Levy uh, writes about how ideational political entrepreneurs, as he calls them, have zeroed in on the country's racial fissures, simultaneously using blackness as the basis for building alliances between the poor black majority and the emerging but nonetheless disaffected elites. He finds a relationship between socioeconomic inequality and social polarization as these entrepreneurs capitalize on socioeconomic inequality to worsen polarization. And Levy's two examples in this case explicitly are Zuma and Julius Malema, the leader of the Economic Freedom Fighters, a party that split off from the ANC and now operates as a kind of an external wing of the Zuma faction. So um, if, we, if we turn now to, to, to corruption, and, and making sense of, of um, corruption. The, the difficulty for me was, uh, you know, writing about this was to f you know, find the links with, with politics. But, but if we look at the project of state capture, we see that it is thoroughly political. Um, uh, state capture, um, by, uh, as, as defined by the State Capacity Research Project, which is a um, 
Uh, it's got about 20 authors, a, a very fan a really fantastic uh, report that was actually released in 2017, so before the Zonda Commission reports came out. Really, uh, it, it captures it um, very, very well. So it talks about state capture as the extensive repurposing of state institutions to redirect rents away from development and into the hands of a power elite that intentionally operates in extra-legal and anti-constitutional ways. So we see that, that they describe this process as um, using radical economic transformation because this is the, the phrase that has now been, been used by the Zuma faction to indicate their commitment to, to really uh, transform economic uh, inequality in South Africa. But they say this, this term is actually used as an ideological smokescreen to mask the rent-seeking practices of the Zuma elite. It amounts to a silent coup because it undermines the democratic and constitutional form of the state and also because it weakens the capability of those very state administrations um, that should be uh, tasked with, with developing uh, South Africa. So those very departments that should be serving the people of South Africa are being weakened. Um, so uh, in another uh, authors, uh, two other authors, Codino, um, uh, they refer to, to this as a Trojan horse of false transformation, um, radical economic transformation. So the, in terms of my own um, recent work, I was trying to make sense of the economic freedom fighters in relation to trying to understand their um, version of, of populism and, and asking questions around whether it can be typified as a fascist form of populism. So what we see in the literature is that there's a, an exclusion of sub-Saharan Africa from the history of, of fascism. And uh, I argue for a, you know, a move beyond the left-right binary that has blinded leftist um, academics to the fascistic dimensions of African nationalism after independence. Uh, Mohamed Bamdani has written um, an interesting analysis of Amin's Uganda using fascism as a lens. And then we have Skarnetia's uh, analysis of Mugabe's Zimbabwe. And while, of course, this is not exactly the same as European fascism of the 1920s, um, we, we, I think it is important for us to, to try and and make sense of this combination of a use of race and a promotion of violence uh, at the same time, ostensibly to, to bring about um, progressive trans transformation. So we're seeing corruption here used as a politics by other means, specifically to enrich a small power elite to the detriment of the larger population. It's important to ask, um, when one is listening to these, uh, these uh, revolutionary discourses, what, what the purpose is that they ultimately um, serve? To which ends do we find violence being incited? And the answer does not point to social justice or racial justice or, um, or anything in, in, in that vein. What we are looking at, rather, is a displacement of apartheid's white oligarchy with a black oligarchy that's bent on self-enrichment, which is at the expense of most um, South Africans. So, so therefore, when we look at the economic freedom fighters' division of the people, their construction of the people, it does not serve as a mobilization of previously excluded groups towards an anti-capitalist advancement of democracy and social justice, as it, as it purports to do, but rather as an opportunistic gathering of, of forces through socialist sloganeering towards predatory accumulation. But to conclude on a positive note, um, I, I do, I'm a big fan of Ashul Mbembe, as you might have noticed, um, and I do agree with his vision of South Africa as a country with the potential of generating an alternative meaning of, of what our world uh, might be. But in order for that to happen, uh, in Walden Bellows' words, we have to have the market drastically re-embedded in society, subject to the primordial human values of community, justice, equality, and solidarity. We need new relations um, uh, of, of ethics, 
We need a reimagining of, of democracy also as a community of life, as Mbembe puts it. And, but this includes also finding a language about claims and liability, redress and, and restitution. I believe that, that this vision is still contained in the Constitution, despite the surge in anti-constitutionalism in South Africa among selected intellectuals. And, um, and I believe that, that it's, it's also to be found in, in the radical concept of, of non-racialism. So, looking forward to a conversation. Thank you.